hurry, hurry, hurry. We hurry ourselves to death in this society that's ever accelerating and we find it increasingly difficult to find rest. And also, what about sleep? Um, we value the ones that only need four hours sleep a night. We admire them and we would like to be like, like them. Um, what is, how do we find relaxation? And does mindfulness maybe contribute to that? What happens if we sleep? What are the mechanisms at work, biologically, neurologically, um, underlying our sleep? And how can we enhance sleep? How can we improve sleep? These are all um, the subjects that we're going to talk about tonight. On behalf of Radboud Reflex and the Donders Institute of uh, Radboud University, um, I welcome you to this live stream. Um, uh, you're, you're sitting at home, you're not in this room. Um, let's hope that uh, in, in a couple of months we will be able again to sit in a, in, a, in, a, in a live audience with a live audience rather than a live stream. But this is, this is it. Um, we've got two speakers, two eminent speakers that are going to guide us through the science of relaxation and the science of sleep. Martin Dressler is a neuroscientist and principal investigator of the Donders Institute of Radboud University. And he researches the cognitive processes that occur during sleep and the use of sleep for our memory and cognitive functioning. Anna Speckens is director of the Radboud UMC Center for Mindfulness and professor of psych psychiatry with a focus on mood and anxiety disorders. She in is involved in scientific research on the effectiveness of mindfulness. Um, first, Martin will give us uh, his story about uh, sleep. Then uh, Anna will follow with uh, her uh, speech on um, mindfulness. And then we're going to have a conversation. At some point, you can actually at home can take part in this conversation. You can do that through Mentimeter. Go to menti.com and fill in the code, and the right code is 5501865. I'm going to repeat this code after our conversation uh, so that you can uh, ask your questions to the speakers, and I will um, uh, transmit those questions uh, to them. So um, I would like to give the floor to Martin Dresler. Yeah, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, do I see the slides, actually? Can I? Okay, there we go. Okay, so I would like to, uh, well, give you a, a comprehensive but brief uh, introduction into sleep. What is it? What is it good for? Um, how can we measure it? Um, as mentioned, I'm uh, working at the Donners Institute, uh, leading the sleep and memory lab there, and uh, Sleep is all we, we, we study and research, in particular, the cognitive functions of sleep. Let's have a brief look uh, why sleep might be important and, and interesting in particular. If you think about it, um, sleep is a, is a strange phenomenon, strange behavior. Um, like all animals sleep, um, humans, for example, sleep for a third of our lives or of our days. Uh, other animals sleep a couple of hours more or less per day, but basically all animals sleep. But if you think about it from an evolutionary point of view, if it is really a, a paradoxical behavior since uh, you are completely helpless and inattentive to a potentially dangerous environment. So if you sleep, there are all kinds of dangerous animals that uh, might be there to eat you. And uh, so this is a, such an obvious disadvantage that sleep has to uh, be related to really essential biological functions to overcomp overcompensate for that. Um, since uh, I think a couple of years at least, um, there's a growing consensus that there's not a single function of sleep, but there are several functions of sleep. There are more basic and maybe more higher functions of sleep. I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, since about 10 years or so, it's increasingly discussed that uh, sleep helps to clear the brain from, uh, from waste products that accumulate uh, during the day. Then. Uh, Sleep is involved in energy metabolism, uh, both saving energy but also um, really like regulating uh, energy. Sleep is uh, um, a highly uh, active state in terms of uh, hormonal activity. So some of our most important hormones um, have their highest and lowest point across the 24-hour cycle in sleep. 
Um, during a pandemic, uh, particularly uh, important, uh, the immunological function of sleep. So the immunological memory is built during sleep, at least to a considerable part. Uh, part. So if you get your uh, uh, COVID vaccination, hopefully in the next couple of uh, weeks or months, uh, then make sure that you have a good night of sleep afterwards. And there are a couple of higher uh, biological functions like memory consolidation, but also affective processes. So emotions are regulated and processed during sleep. And there might even be a uh, a biological function to the subjective side of sleep, namely dreaming and the ideas that the, the brain simulates uh, potential reality. And there might be many other functions. Um, however, uh, like how do we, um, uh, um, on the one hand, measure sleep, but also can 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 improve sleep. So if uh, if sleep goes wrong, if uh, sleep is disturbed, many of these uh, functions do not uh, um, work properly, and might lead to all kinds of health impairments. Um, uh, and, and and these are uh, related to to many of of the big players in uh, in, in health and disease. So. Um, uh, degenerative diseases like, like Alzheimer's disease, also psychiatric diseases, all of these uh, are related to um, sleep problems. Um, so how can we sleep better, more healthily, uh, but can we improve sleep in a couple of ways? To, uh, to make some progress there, we first need to measure sleep. And the gold standard in sleep research is so-called polysomnography. So that is a method of several bi uh, physiological metho methods where we uh, measure uh, brain activity, so electrical activity going on in the brain, but also the activity of the eyes, so eye movements we measure during sleep, and also muscle activity. And I'll just give you a, a rough uh, like um, characterization or impression how that looks. So there, there's, sleep is not a uniform state, but there are several different stages of sleep. We have a transition state that still looks quite similar to wakefulness. Uh, however, the, the, uh, uh, the brain waves uh, slow down already. Then we have uh, light sleep that is, however, like real consolidated sleep already that is characterized by a couple of micro elements that you might see here. Then we have deep sleep or slow wave sleep that is characterized by these very large and very slow waves. So really that the deepest uh, state of sleep. And then at some point we switch into a completely different state called REM sleep or rapid eye movement sleep that from its uh, brain patterns looks uh, very much like wakefulness actually. Um, however, the muscle tone is completely lacking and the eyes are moving rapidly. And that's why uh, the sleep stage is called like this. And uh, these uh, sleep stages do not occur randomly across the night, but in a very regular fashion, typically. So we have several of these cycles, typically four or five cycles uh, throughout the night. And we have most of our deep sleep in the first half of the night and most of our REM sleep in the second half of the night. And these sleep stages uh, do not only look differently, um, in particular from, from their physiological signals, but they might also fulfill different biological functions. So um, if, we, if we really want to benefit from sleep, then we probably need all of these stages. The question is now, if sleep is so important, and probably all of these sleep stages are so important, um, what happens if we don't get them? Um, and is there maybe a way around it nevertheless so that we can sleep less? Uh, are there techniques to, to optimize sleep, to, to make sleep more efficient, either generally because we want to be more healthy or people that think they wouldn't have the time to, to sleep for a full eight hours or so, uh, are there any tricks? And there's a lot that is discussed and some of that is studied and I'll give you a couple of examples and we'll see if it, what of that might work or not. And I'll try to associate that with the different biological functions of sleep. Let's have a look, for example, for the endocrine function of sleep, so hormone activity. And there look in particular in, in a phenomenon that is also discussed increasingly uh, in the internet and uh, like a like growing number of people claim to, to, to uh, like try something like that out, and that is the phenomenon of polyphasic sleep. So normally we sleep monophasically, most of us, at least in our cu culture, so we have one phase of sleep during the night, about eight hours or something like that. But there are also cultures that sleep biphasically, um, so they have uh, a, a normal night of sleep or maybe a bit less and then have a nap during the day. The question is, if, if, uh, if you feel refreshed after a nap, 
can't you have more naps and maybe less sleep during the night? And by that can make uh, sleep more efficient. And indeed, there is a discussion going on that uh, if you just have naps throughout the day without like extended periods of sleep in the night, uh, that you then in total could maybe get away with less sleep, uh, but still with the same benefits. Um, there's very little research on that. Uh, we have, however, uh, a couple of years ago had the um, opportunity to um, follow a couple of students that wanted to change to such a polyphasic sleep rhythm, uh, 10 students in total. As you see here, uh, so on the uh, uh, y-axis uh, on the left you see these 10 uh, single students and then on the x-axis you see the number of days that they really made it on this rhythm in the sense that uh, like, like how long they, they uh, willfully, voluntarily stayed on that rhythm. You see already after a couple of days the first people dropped out and basically after four to five weeks uh, even uh, like the, the last uh, student dropped out. However, he was so kind to uh, come to the lab so we could really study him under this radical polyphasic sleep uh, rhythm where he slept for um, six naps a day, just 20 minutes each. So cumulatively just two hours of sleep. And he did that for, for five weeks. Uh, and towards the end, he had him in the lab uh, in the beginning as well. So this was his uh, sleep um, across uh, the 24 hours, uh, like before he switched to this radical uh, rhythm. You see uh, like this typical pattern that we have deep sleep in the first half of the night and more REM sleep in the second half of the night. And then five, five weeks later, under this polyphasic rhythm, uh, you see that indeed he has this uh, six naps of 20 minutes each. Uh, so really just a total of two hours. And now the interesting thing for sleep researchers is, is uh, at least is if we zoom in here uh, into these six single naps, then we see that um, uh, the, the general pattern of sleep looks very similar to, to the normal sleep. Meaning in the first two naps of the night, uh, he had most of his slow wave sleep, of his deep sleep. In the second half of the night, he had most of his REM sleep. So the general pattern of uh, sleep appears to be preserved. However, as I said, uh, we want to have a look into the endocrine function of sleep. So what did his hormones do? And uh, a couple of hormones actually didn't change much, but with one notable exception, and that is growth hormone. Growth hormone is particularly important, uh, of course, if you still grow, so if you develop, but even as an adult, uh, it's, it's important for bone structure and other bodily processes. And uh, the interesting thing in, uh, about growth hormone is that, that almost all of our growth hormone we will release in the first half of the night. And that's what we see here. So that was before he went on this polyphasic rhythm. Um, like most of his growth hormone was released in the first half of the night and then it went back to almost zero. Now on the polyphasic rhythm, so these six snaps of 20 minutes, um, we see that he almost completely stopped releasing growth hormones. So that was a, a more than 95% reduction in the release of growth hormone. Uh, and something like that obviously cannot be very healthy. Um, so, it is quite striking that it appears to be possible for some people to really live on such a rhythm, however, it cannot be very healthy. Um, let's look at some higher function of sleep, memory. Um, so that's a, a field that is uh, studied already since about 100 years, uh, but since uh, 20 years or so it's increasingly studied. Um, and uh, we know by now from animal studies, uh, like what, what the neural uh, basis and mechanisms are. So uh, if, if you have a rat, for example, uh, like learning the way through a maze um, and you record single electrodes, as you see here in the, in the colored uh, uh, sketch, um, then they might uh, be activated in a cer certain sequence. And now if you record that very same animal afterwards during sleep, you see that the very same neurons or brain cells um, get activated in, a, in, in more or less the same sequence. And we call that replay or reactivations of memories, and that is thought to be one of the core underlying mechanisms of, uh, of the memory supporting function of sleep. Um, in humans, it's difficult to study single cells, but we can do co uh, behavioral tests, and that is a classical test from colleagues from the US. So they, they ask people to learn uh, such a memory game with certain pictures on a, on a spatial board. Uh, and the question was uh, that the task was to learn where the position of these uh, uh, pictures were. Uh, were. 
Um, and these pictures were always uh, shown uh, together with the sound. So if you saw the, the cat or the kitten here, uh, then the computer always played a meow. And if you saw the kettle, then, then you heard a whistle or something like that. Now half of these uh, sounds were then played during sleep afterwards. Um, and then it was tested uh, like how well the people did with the cued words, so there where the, these sounds were played during sleep, uh, compared to the non cued words where there was no sound during sleep. And it turns out that there was much less forgetting for the cued words compared to the non cued words. And that has been replicated many times since then. Also, here at the Donners Institute, colleagues did that uh, while people even slept in the scanner during the night. Um, and uh, memory related structures uh, were more activated uh, uh, um, during the, the presentation of these cues. Um, the question is why? doesn't, uh, like, if, if we can improve memory by that, why is memory per se not, uh, not much better? So why is, is sleep not helping all kinds of memories? Uh, we tested that in a study where we uh, asked people to learn two different uh, lists of words uh, with a mnemonic strategy, so a memory strategy that they really uh, learn the whole list at once. Um, and one list uh, we did not cue at all, so they were not uh, related with these sounds. And in the other list, we cued exactly every other word. So half of the words in that one list were cued uh, during sleep. So these sounds were played during sleep. Um, now what we saw is that if you compare the two lists after sleep, they did not differ. So the cueing of the one list apparently did not lead to a, a benefit for the whole list. However, if you look at the one list that was cued and compare those items that were cued, so where that sound was played, compared to those where there weren't, then you see that compared to the control list, the non cued items were remembered worse and the cued items were remembered better. So in a sense, the, the cued items uh, benefited only on the cost of other parts of memory. So you can improve certain kinds of memory through these mechanisms during sleep at the cost of others. And we could show that uh, the very same uh, brain related, uh, memory related structures were also um, related to this phenomenon. There are other, um, by now, many other uh, ways to, to improve and, and uh, um, um, enhance memory during sleep um, by, uh, by enhancing brain waves, by enhancing in particular these slow waves, um, also with electrical stimulation, with acoustic stimulation, um, uh, but these effects are typically rather small. Um, let's look at the simulation function of sleep. I said already that is the subjective side of sleep, dreaming. So um, for many years it has been thought that, and, and still is discussed, that dreaming is maybe only a so-called epiphenomenon, meaning uh, it doesn't have a function per se as in itself. Uh, it's maybe just a passive reflection of uh, some basic processes going on uh, during sleep. Um, however, since a couple of years, it is increasingly uh, discussed in how far um, uh, that is not the case, but, but really also the subjective side might, might have its own biological function. And the idea is that, um, that it serves as a simulation of reality, and in particular, a simulation of threatening situations. And so we can learn and train coping strategies for these threats during our dreams in a completely safe environment. Uh, the same is true for social situations. So we can train new uh, social strategy to, to cope with other people and, and to, to interact with other people in a safe environment without making a fool of ourselves. And obviously that is very difficult during wakefulness uh, without making a fool of ourselves. And also like training threatening situations is difficult during wakefulness. We cannot just try out new strategies how to fight the wolf or something like that. Um, and that might actually be the bi biological function of sleep. How can we influence dreaming? Um, is there, are there also ways? Indeed, there are several techniques. And one uh, like prominent phenomenon is the, the uh, phenomenon of uh, so-called lucid dreaming. Lucid dreaming um, is the phenomenon of becoming aware of the dream during uh, ongoing sleep. So if during a dream I realize, oh, this is strange, this has to be a dream, this is by definition a so-called lucid dream. 
Um, Lucid Dream for many years, uh, um, well, so about 10 years ago, so it, it, it uh, um, made its entrance into the, the wider pop culture uh, by, by the movie Inception, uh, but many other movies uh, uh, are there as well. Um, but for many years, it has been not taken overly serious. Uh, it was thought that uh, maybe it was a false memory or something like that, until about 40 years ago, when it was demonstrated that it's a real biological phenomenon, and the um, the, the um, interesting study that was done there is that uh, experienced lucid dreamers were asked to move their eyes during sleep. So we know that the body is completely paralyzed during REM sleep no normally. Um, however, the eyes uh, are not uh, part of this uh, general para paralysis, but they move rapidly. That's why we call it REM sleep. Um, and it turns out that if in your dream you look to the left, then the eyes of your sleeping body go to the left. And by that, uh, someone who during his or her dream realizes it is a dream can communicate with the outside by moving the eyes to the left, to the right, to the left. And these eye movements can then clearly be seen in the electroocologram, so in the electric recordings of the eye activities. And we can prearrange uh, like tasks and, and eye patterns with, uh, with these subjects. In international collaboration, we uh, just uh, um, well, like are about to publish a paper where we even show that these communication can be uh, like both sides, uh, that we can uh, like give some information into the dream by uh, just whispering, for example, um, one plus two or something like that, brief math problems. And then uh, subjects can, uh, like with eye movements, give us an answer out of that dream. And uh, that is a, a like for, for research, that is a handy phenomenon since we can ask people to do certain tasks during dreaming and indicate the start and the end point of these tasks uh, with eye movements, and then we can look what happens in their brains. Um, uh, a study that we did a couple of years ago is, for example, let people move their left and right hand and look what happens on the brain basis and it turns out at very similar brain regions, uh, if you do not actually execute your hand movements but really just dream about it, um, the same brain regions get activated as during real hand movements during wakefulness. Um, lucid dreaming has also other applications, uh, clinical, appli clinical applications, I'm almost done. Uh, how can I put this off? So, um, so clinical applications uh, for nightmare therapy, for example, uh, but also practical uh, uh, applications during sports. Um, how can you try to learn lucid dreaming? Uh, there's a very simple strategy, and that is start a dream diary. So write uh, down every dream you can, uh, you can remember, even if it's just a fragment. And if there's uh, like a recurrent topic, if you are, for example, always dreaming about your primary school, then make use of that by associating that thought of your primary school with the thought, this is a dream. And uh, if that becomes a strong association, the next time you dream about your primary school, there's a good chance that then this uh, association get, gets activated and you ask yourself, is this a dream? Um, there are many other strategies, uh, some more technological. There are even uh, like certain medications that, that help lucid dreaming. There, there are uh, technical um, uh, gadgets. Um, that with, uh, with either electrical stimulation or uh, um, visual stimulation help lucid dreaming. So there are many strategies to induce such a phenomenon. Um, are there any risks to lucid dreaming? So are, are dreams really meant to be lucid or non-lucid? I indeed believe that, uh, that uh, the biological um, functions of, uh, of dreaming are related to the non-lucid part. However, even the most frequent lucid dreamers have maybe uh, are maybe lucid for five minutes, 10 minutes maybe per night. So more than 90, 95% or so of their sleep is still non-lucid. Um, okay, that was just a, a brief example of uh, what sleep is, what sleep is good for, and how you might enhance or, or optimize sleep. Uh, the, the question, as uh, this, this famous uh, citation from, from Jurassic Park is, of course, everything that, that scientists could come up with to show, to optimize something and, and to try something, um, even if it works, is that something we should really try and aim for? And with that thought, I would like to give over to the next speaker who will go on with similar thoughts. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. Uh, so now the... <laughs> the floor is, I give the floor to Anders Speckens, who's going to speak about the, um, uh, about meditation, uh, mindfulness and the effects of it. Anne? 
Thank you very much. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here, although I'm not a dinosaur. I'm still looking at mice here, if I'm right. So I don't know who is going to put up the slides about mindfulness. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so as uh, you already um, I have been told, my name is Anne Speckens, I'm a professor of psychiatry and I'm director of the Center for Mindfulness, which is located in the Radboud University Medical Center. Here's a picture of uh, our center. And at it, we um, provide mindfulness courses for patients with psychiatric disorder, because that's our profession, but also and increasingly to patients with chronic somatic conditions like cancer, for instance, or uh, patients with Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis. And we offer courses to healthcare professionals like medical students, um, medical and surgical residents, uh, GPs or medical consultants, who, as you will know, have a, a, a pretty stressful profession, and we try to support them by offering them mindfulness um, courses as well. We do a lot of uh, scientific research, mainly on the clinical effectiveness of mindfulness-based interventions, but also, and uh, in collaboration with the Donders Institute and also with uh, Martin Dreisler, uh, uh, personally on the, the working mechanisms of mindfulness-based interventions. So what is mindfulness? A lot of you will probably have heard about it, and I have uh, brought uh, a definition that has been provided by Willem Kuiken and Christi uh, Christina Feldman in their latest uh, book about uh, mindfulness, the the um, meeting of traditions from the East with the traditions from the West, as a, um, a natural trainable human capacity to be present in the current moment, to bring attention to that moment and awareness to the, uh, to the whole of the experience, and in a particular way with friendliness, with curiosity, without having a, a judgment, um, with discernment, and in the service of suffering less, enjoying greater well-being, which was the title of my talk, and um, leading a meaningful, rewarding life. And we'll get back to that at, uh, at the end of my presentation. And uh, this is a picture of John Kabat-Zinn. He, he actually designed the mindfulness courses as we are teaching it now all over the world. Uh, and he, uh, he called that the mindfulness-based stress reduction, uh, an eight-week course in which uh, he taught these mindfulness skills to groups. He taught them to, to much bigger groups. We, we teach them to groups of, of eight to 12 participants, um, which come together uh, an afternoon or an, a morning, two and a half hours, and um, uh, practice together, discuss what they are experiencing during the practice. And people are asked to, to, to practice those mindfulness uh, uh, meditations daily, on a daily basis, in between the sessions. And a silent day in which people practice for six hours um, uh, on a day is part of the program as well. So what do people learn from mindfulness? First of all, they learn to stop, to get out of their habitual pattern, like we all uh, are, of, of uh, leading our lives according to our diary. So they, they get out of that pattern, they uh, start noticing where their attention is, they learn to, to, to bring back their attention to what they want to focus on, concentration. They, um, they start to, to allow the experience as it presents itself without judgment, and by that they, they learn the, the relationship between sensations they experience in their body, emotions, thoughts they might be having. And also they, they start noticing their own automatic patterns, patterns of how, of, of um, reactive patterns, and they can be compensatory patterns or avoiding patterns. And the moment you start to, to notice them, um, 
you create some space to uh, to choose whether you want to follow those or whether you want to uh, to react to a particular situation in a different way. And that can be by allowing negative emotions rather than repressing or avoiding them and letting go of automatic reactions rather than, than uh, unquestioningly following them. And that usually results in a better self-care and also in a more friendly, more kind uh, attitude towards oneself and others. So the research, scientific research on mindfulness has started around 2000 and gradually increases over the years. This is a rather old picture already. I tried to renew it, but uh, for, for areas of research where more than 10,000 uh, publications have been published, um, Web of Science doesn't produce nice pictures like this anymore. But um, over, over recent years, um, scientific research in this area has, has really increased. And if we look at the applications of mindfulness in healthy individuals like we are or for student population, this is, this is one of the uh, recent meta-analyses. I've brought a meta-analysis. It's a uh, compilation of existing research. In this case, it's a compilation of, of 18 different studies. And some of them have been uh, carried out in student populations, some in healthcare professionals like uh, we do and some in the general population. And as you can see, uh, here is mentioned the Hatches G, that is a measure of effect size. And uh, as you can see, these, these studies have a, have a, a moderate to, to large effect size, which means that they, that they result in a, a significant improvement in particular symptoms. And what kind of symptoms have been measured in these healthy populations. Sometimes there are um, measures of anxiety, depression, stress, psychological distress, which is a, a combination of uh, anxiety and depressive symptoms. Burnout questionnaires have been used and quality of life measures. And as you can see across these uh, variety of, of psychological measures, the, uh, the effect sizes of the mindfulness-based intervention have been uh, have been mostly large, slightly less in burnout, interestingly, for which uh, mindfulness has been uh, yeah, uh, usually applied. And here you can see a, a sort of rough association betwi between the extent of mindfulness and compassion skills that people cultivate and the extent of the improvement of, of anxiety and depression, for instance. And as you can see there, there seems to be an association so that, that um, suggests that, that the cultivation of mindfulness skills and, and compassion skills can contribute to the reduction of both anxiety and depression. Now, Martin will be glad to hear that there's also quite some neuroscientific research now on mindfulness. Um, and this is actually a, a meta-analysis of structural MRI studies. So looking at the, the structure of the, the brain, the density of both the, the white and gray matter. And these, are, these studies are usually sort of comparing long-term meditators with meditation naive people or uh, comparing people before a mindfulness course and after that. And what you can see here is, that is, is sort of... Uh, eight or nine areas in the brain that consistently sort of changed in, in density uh, as a consequence of, of meditation. And, and here they're listed for the, for the, uh, the interested uh, people amongst you. And interestingly, these are areas that are also, also significantly linked to, to, um, to functions or psychological functions that are related to mindfulness. So things like meta-awareness, being, being aware of your own cognitive functions, bodily awareness, memory consolidation, interestingly, and also self and emotion regulation. So we don't only look at brain structure, we also look at the functioning of 
the brain with functional MRI studies. Um, and in these studies, um, meditation has been uh, able to be shown to, to um, stimulate or, or uh, cultivate the, the um, brain circuits associated with uh, things like alerting, with uh, sustaining attention, the, the monitoring, um, disengagement from stimuli and shifting of attention, the sort of processes that you need to, to um, sustain this meditative process. And if you look at studies that have been carried out uh, on sleep in particular, um, uh, this, is, this is one of the most recent meta-analyses that I could find on the effect of uh, mindfulness-based interventions on sleep quality. And this is a meta-analysis that only included RCTs, so studies that have included uh, a control group and that randomly assigned people to either the intervention group, the mindfulness intervention, or a particular control condition. Uh, and that is that is a gold standard if you would like to look at the effectiveness of, of a particular intervention, but also only included studies with an active uh, active control condition. So usually when you develop an intervention, many studies uh, compare the intervention with a weightless control condition or no treatment control condition. And here they, uh, they have only selected those studies that actually try to control for things like um, peer support of uh, attention from a therapist, uh, a rationale, people engaging in a particular intervention. So these are the studies with a non-specific active control condition. And as you can see, it's... Um, it's a graph in which the percentage of improvement has been um, demonstrated. The blue bars show the percentage of improvement in the different studies, both post-treatment and the red bars uh, at longer-term follow-up. And you can see that most of the studies, the included studies, um, showed a uh, uh, significant improvement of sleep quality after the mindfulness-based interventions. Now, that is different if you um, uh, compare the mindfulness-based intervention with specific active control conditions. And with specific conditions, you um, could think about uh, sleep management interventions, also cognitive behavioral therapy uh, for insomnia, for instance, or other, other kinds of interventions that were specifically aimed at improving sleep. And now you can see that the, the amount of difference is, is much less and, and uh, in, in many cases non-significant. And there's even one study in which the mindfulness-based intervention performed worse than the control condition, as you can see, the sort of blue bar under, under the uh, X axis. And that was a study in which um, cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia was used, which is a pretty effective intervention. And also, um, I read about 50% of the, the people uh, participating in the MBSR dropped out. So that, um, that is a bit of a, an exception to the, to the other studies. So how do we think that mindfulness actually sort of affects um, the quality of sleep? And as you can see here, and as you might uh, remember of my uh, first explanation of what, of what mindfulness is about, you can see that, that mindfulness affects um, a few psychological processes that are important for sleep. Things like uh, being aware of things, decentering, with which is meant that people learn to, to look from a distance to their own experience rather than identifying with it and sort of uh, getting... Um, getting upset or involved in it, acceptance of the situation rather than um, getting upset about it. So th those, those kind of processes lead to, to a higher degree of psychological flexibility, and that can actually sort of break 
vicious circles that might perpetuate sleeping problems or insomnia. So it might help to decrease pre-bad arousal. So, so if people are more relaxed and calm when they, they go to bed, it, it might improve sleep. But also it might reduce um, ideas, beliefs people have, have about their insomnia. And uh, in that, in that uh, way, contribute to improving sleep quality. So in the last part of my talk, I would like to, uh, to tell you a bit more about the, the Buddhist roots of mindfulness, as I think that that actually um, is an important basis and, and also are, are interesting ideas that might help us ourselves to, uh, to find more calm or peace in this hectic world. And mindfulness has, it, has its roots in the, the Buddhist tradition. And as you might know, uh, we've got, of course, a lot of Buddhist traditions nowadays, but they all have some, some common principles, and uh, which is uh, one of the most uh, important teachings of the Buddha. And they are the Four Noble Truths. And here you can see the sort of traditional framing of these Four Noble Truths. The first is that... Um, Life inevitably involves suffering. Life is suffering. That suffering is caused by craving. That we can free ourselves from craving or, or from suffering if we, if we stop craving. And that there's a way of, of leading our lives in which we can put that into practice. And um, one of the... Um, exponents of, of the, the, the uh, secular Buddhism, it's called Stephen Batchelor. He, he gave a lecture here in Radboud Reflex a few, few years ago. He, he translated those more classical formulations into, into language that we as, as modern uh, human beings might be able to better relate to. And I've uh, listed them here for you. So he calls them the four great tasks as, as some of the things that we might actually sort of um, engage with in our lives. And the first is to experience life, experience life to the full and acknowledge, understand it, embrace it, particularly the parts of life that might be difficult for us. Now, we've, we've got ample of exa examples nowadays, of course, that we're confronted with in this uh, corona epidemic to let go of instinctive reactivity, that's the translation of, of craving, that in reaction to this, these um, intrinsic difficulties, we, we usually, or we pretty com commonly have the reaction of, of fantasizing, clutching, um, of, of wanting our lives to be different from what it is, or not wanting the life that we have. And, uh, this makes things usually worse rather than better. So if we start noticing that and, and are able to let go of that reactivity, we, we can create more freedom in the way we relate to our lives. And, um, and, and freedom to choose how we would like to, to lead our lives, even in the face of difficulty. And we could then um, uh, respond, um, choose what we would like to, to spend our time on, what kind of values we would like to, uh, to, to follow or to, to actually um, um, form in our lives and to cultivate a path, as he calls it. And that path, it, uh, in the Buddhist tradition, is called the Eightfold Path. Can, um, can take form in different dimensions. Here they are list listed as the, as the classical eight, eight, uh, eightfold, eight, eight factors that it consists of. To have uh, an understanding of what your life um, consists of, to, to be clear in your intentions, 
to uh, to be wise and compassionate in your com communication with others. That you, uh, in the things you do, that you do that on a, an ethical ground. That you choose your work properly. Choose a work that that you actually sort of um, contribute to to the values you adhere to. To put effort also in your own spiritual development to cultivate your presence of mind and to cultivate mental integration. And if you're able to do so, uh, and this is the, the quote I would like to, to close off with, seriously tackling these four tasks lead to a process of awakening, of realizing our full human potential to live intelligently, compassionately, and hopefully with wisdom. Alone or with others, we can experience the deepest fulfillment that we humans are capable of experiencing. Human flourishing is also uh, the term that's being used for that. So that is what I had to say. Thank you very much. Thanks for your attention. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, both of you, for your interesting and uh, valuable uh, lessons that we've uh, learned. Uh, Maybe um, a first question uh, to 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 Martin, and, but actually maybe also to you. Um, if sleep is so important as you sketch it, why do we value it so little uh, in our society? Why do we find it so important to have as le uh, uh, as little sleep as possible, etc.? That's a very good question, and I cannot answer it. <laughs> um, I, I think most sleep researchers actually value it quite a lot, not only because they, they do study it, but also mm -hmm. from the subjective side. And I think um, it is not that widespread that it's uh, valued so little. I think many people do value sleep quite a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and I think latest, when you, when you run into sleep problems, so if you have insomnia, real sleep disturbances, then you value it all the more. So sleep disturbances are, in, in many psychiatric disorders, are one of the key symptoms where patients complain most about it. Mm -hmm. So even if, uh, if you have a busy job and would like to have a couple of hours more per day, as soon as you run into problems, psychiatric problems, and you experience sleep disturbances, then latest, I think, uh, most people will start to value sleep quite a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and what about relaxation? The, uh, isn't that the same, the same point? Uh, are, we, are we able actually to value that as much as we should uh, if we listen to you? Yeah. Well, I, I talked a bit about um, craving as as sort of a way to get out of suffering and and one of the the sort of many of the things we culturally crave for are success for instance or power or being popular or being seen as someone who's who's um attractive or sporting or whatever so all these cultural Values we we as a as a as a society sort of crave for are things that are opposite to sleeping and being relaxed. Yeah. <laughs> to be yeah. honest, yeah. and even within a university um, environment or an academic environment, what what is sort of valued there is uh, publishing papers and presenting uh, lectures at international yeah. uh, conferences and travel from here to there and and have a high impact uh, whatever mm -hmm. yeah so um i think um it's difficult as an individual to disengage from that pool that mm -hmm. that's uh, being exerted upon you and um choose to to uh spend time in your life to sleep <laughs> or to spend on other things that are fulfilling and relaxing like singing in a choir mm -hmm. yes yeah 
Um, but um, an, an, another question uh, about mindfulness. Um, so mindfulness could be a strategy to have more relaxation in your life, but the, the way you brought it, especially the last couple of slides, um, mindfulness seems to be part of a much larger uh, form of life, uh, so to speak. Uh, so mindfulness is only one of the strategies that you, you mentioned. Am, am I right about that? Yes, my, mindfulness is one factor that, that sort of um, usually leads to a process in people of um, getting insight, getting insight in their own reactions, their own patterns, and uh, not unusually leads to a realization in people that they, they for instance, they... Um, ask themselves much more in their work than is actually reasonable mm -hmm. and that they so um, and that's actually also the aim of it that it that it might lead to um, to um, to get your life or to to lead your life in a way that's more appropriate more suitable more fulfilling and that sometimes lead to people making different choices and leaving their job or finding another job or leaving their marriage or mm -hmm. um, uh, putting more energy in their mm -hmm. <laughs> marriage or yeah so it, it's not um, sometimes people come to us um, to participate in courses with the expectation that it's a relaxation course mm -hmm. and we all always warn them and say mm -hmm. look it's, it's not a relaxation course it's it's a course in which you learn how to be present with what is and what is is not always pleasant and relaxing it's it's uh, most of the time difficult or or um, uh, there are things that you might worry about or be anxious about and and being able to to um, to uh, to acknowledge that mm -hmm. uh, is not always easy but in the end it will help to um, to design your life in a way that's that's better suited mm -hmm. and more helpful. Mm -hmm. um, there is a, a broad relation between relaxation and sleep. It, the, the relation is so is so that uh, you are even engaged in a, in a joint project. I I, uh, I just heard. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, it's 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 a project uh, where we we look at the effects of mindfulness training on inflammatory bowel disease, and uh, in particular in how far mindfulness uh, like helps to reduce stress and by that uh, help to sleep better. And what we are particularly interested in is uh, the interaction between all of these uh, elements. So in in how far um, stress might be a mediator or sleep might be a mediator. Uh, so what is really the, the mechanistic functioning of if mindfulness works in this disease? Mm -hmm. uh, what is the mechanistic functioning? So does, does sleep uh, play a mediating role or is, is completely separate so that that, uh, that you might have like a benefit in this part of life and this part of life, but completely independent? Mm -hmm. uh, but from a scientific pers perspective, of course, it's always more interesting if, if, if these different variables and elements are connected and, and then figure out might, might there even be a causality in that or that direction. Mm -hmm. And it's also meant to improve sleep for people that have these, that have these problems, I guess. Exactly. Yeah. 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 yeah, as Martin has pointed out, sleep problems are very common in people with both um, psychological problems and in people with somatic conditions. Yeah. And it's, it's um, often a factor that's actually sort of... Um, um, worsening the con the underlying condition, so uh, this program that that uh, got that we got funding for for this problem is zonnem we leefstijl geneeskunde. So it's it's uh, aimed at at um, encouraging people to change their lifestyle and and like you said, sleeping relaxation is actually part of a healthier lifestyle. Mm -hmm. In addition to physical exercise and and uh, having a healthy diet. Mm -hmm. it's, it's often overlooked, this sort of mental side of it, but it's uh, as important as the other dimensions. And this is what you're going to research. So this is uh, a really promising uh, subject. It, it's a, an ex yeah. Uh, yeah, 
exciting uh, enterprise, particularly because, uh, as I have shown, the research on mindfulness is, is usually based on uh, self-report questionnaires, mm -hmm. people reporting mm -hmm. on the quality of sleep. And uh, the kind of research that Martin is doing is, is of course, very sophisticated with looking actually at, at the different phases. And uh, so we'll be able to, to say a lot more about that. Okay, and talking about sleep enhancement, um, uh, from your talk, I, I, I didn't quite get a, what I should do to improve my sleep. Uh, I, 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 I find myself having only six hours, six and a half hours. It's not, not uh, as much as there should be. What should I do? There are many strategies, and uh, I think one of, one of the key strategies relates very much to, to, uh, to mindfulness, um, and, and that is worry less about sleep. So that, that ah. is one of the key problems in insomnia, that, that people worry too much about their sleep and, and have sort of uh, dysfunctional uh, like cognitive uh, beliefs uh, mm -hmm. about what sleep has to be and, and how sleep should look like. Mm -hmm. And uh, just accepting that, that every once in a while you have a bad night and uh, in particular accepting that, that healthy sleep does not mean that, that you go to bed and immediately fall asleep and for eight hours like, like sleep without awakening once and then waking up uh, fresh in the morning. That just doesn't happen even, even in the most healthy sleeper. And, and just mm -hmm. accepting that, that, that sleep um, like is uh, like related to some arousals during the night, maybe some brief wakefulness periods and so on, that is already a really big step. Since if you worry too much, then that becomes a vicious circle mm -hmm. and you start going to bed worrying and, and that worrying might actually keep you mm -hmm. from, from, from sleeping. Yeah, so you get into a circle. Yeah. yeah. So that, that's one strategy. Are there more than... Um, th there's uh, there's a whole field of uh, or like like a set of, of rules called sleep hygiene, mm -hmm. um, like like basic rules to to make sure that uh, that, that you that you have the conditions to sleep uh, uh, well. Uh, for example, try to sleep in a dark room, uh, in a quiet room, of course. Um, get up at the at the same time in the morning. Not necessarily go to sleep at the same time, but only go to sleep if you are really tired. Um, so that is also part of, of this like self-reinforcing dysfunctional uh, like worrying. Do that, not that look at your iPhone during the night. Of yeah. course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, in, in not only iPhone, but but use your bed and your bedroom for sleep and not for work and 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 uh, other like daytime activities. Um, so so that that also like uh, cognitively you associate your your bedroom with sleep and not mm -hmm. with worry and work and stress. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I think these are good tips. People at home will be very grateful. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, um, coming back, I'm, I'm trying to find a bridge between uh, mindfulness and, and sleep. You, you talked about the effects of mindfulness on uh, sleep. I didn't quite, quite get that, but the, 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 the basic message is that mindfulness improves your sleep, right? Yes, and, and one of the, the ideas that links into what Martin is talking about about worry or rumination, it's sometimes called. We know it, that's an important factor in, in many uh, psychological problems like anxiety and depression, that people either worry too much about what's going to happen tomorrow, or they ruminate too much about what happened yesterday. And um, what we do know about mindfulness-based interventions is that be because people become more aware of what's going on also in their in their minds, they're able to recognize that better and um, let go of that. So a reduction of rumination is one of the, the possible working mechanisms of mindfulness and also one of the mechanisms that might help um, to improve sleep quality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so it, it, it really works. Um, yes, that, that's, that's the message. one of the, the possible working mechanisms and, and several others that um, I've indicated is, is sort of this, this idea that um, de-identifying from your thoughts. Mm -hmm. As human beings, we, we have the tendency of believing that everything we think is true mm -hmm. and also believing everything we feel is true. And, and that's a way that we, we actually sort of um, work ourselves up about mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. and uh, with mindfulness you you learn to to set a step back and to look at it so to observe your own thoughts and emotions and by by that process that that sort of de-identification decentering process it's sometimes called you already sort of um, 
sort of disengage from thoughts and emotions and, and they, they have less impact on you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's another process that might help, for instance, with these ideas or expectations about thoughts to, to realize, oh, it's just a belief. It doesn't need to be true. Um, even if I don't, I don't sleep uh, long tonight, it doesn't mean that I will mess up my presentation tomorrow. Mm -hmm. and, and let go of that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so that's uh, another possible mechanism. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, we go to the questions of the audience. Um, as said, you can ask your question through menti.com and use the code 5501865. I think we already have, um, let's see, um, a couple of um, questions. Oh, yes, a whole list. Um, Oh dear! <laughs> <laughs> I hope I know the answer. <laughs> so that's the way we. We'll, we'll see. It we'll usually see. sort of we'll uh, goes. <laughs> uh, you, you'll be, you'll be, you'll be, you'll be fine. Um, uh, what happens? That this is a question, obviously, for Martin. I think. What happens to the brain during sleep par paralysis? Is there a difference in brain waves during dreams compared to nightmares or fever dreams? So types of dreams. Yeah, so sleep paralysis, uh, for, for people who have never heard about that yes. term, is, uh, is the phenomenon of, of waking up and not being able to move. And uh, as, as shown in the introduction, um, REM sleep is associated to full uh, um, like paralysis of all bodily muscles. So, so we are really actively paralyzed uh, during, during REM sleep. Um, and normally the, the brain is a, is a highly synchronous and, and, and uh, well-tuned machinery. Uh, and therefore, if we change from one state into the next, from non-REM sleep into REM sleep, or from REM sleep to sleep into wakefulness, for example, all of these uh, different um, like processes in the brain change at the same time. But sometimes it happens that that some of these processes or some of some brain regions uh, need a bit longer, and mm -hmm. that is exactly what what's happening in sleep paralysis. Mm -hmm. That uh, that the like the brainstem con con controls this uh, muscle paralysis. Um, and if, uh, if so, like first the rest of the brain wakes up, but that part of the brain is still sort of in REM sleep mode, um, then we feel this muscle paralysis that is just related to REM sleep. And it might even take a couple of seconds uh, or, or 10, 20 seconds in, 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 in the worst case. Mm -hmm. um, and if you do not know about like this phenomenon and, and what, what the result, like what, what the underlying mechanism is, that can be quite terrifying. Yeah. Um, the question, second question was about uh, differences between uh, different kinds of Some dreams. dreams. Um, there is uh, there is um, uh, very little research, actually, in particular about these uh, like rather rare forms of, of consciousness and, and, and dreaming, um, and therefore not very robust um, uh, uh, evidence for for like like on the neural level, like how they differ. Um, there, there is uh, in recent years more and more data really looking at, uh, at different dreams and kinds of dreams and uh, different experiences in particular like if you for example wake up and have um, like have the feeling that you have, you have dreamt but cannot remember anything something that's yeah. called by now white dreams um, and uh, that actually seems to differ from from uh, like actually not dreaming at all when you wake up and and you are convinced okay there was just nothing yeah. Um, and, and indeed, uh, these different types of dreams appear to differ uh, in terms of EEG activity and, and neural activity. Mm -hmm. And you talked about the function of dreams. So might they have different functions also, biologically, neurologically? That, that is a very good question. Um, that is, uh, so so the, the, the idea about the function of dreaming is, is indeed that we have this safe training ground to try out new yes. coping strategies. Yes. Um, and I mentioned already that, that I do believe that, that non-lucidity, non non-lucid dreams uh, like, um, might have a function uh, or a benefit. Um, and, and the benefit might be that we take our dreams serious while we are dreaming. And, and if we want to really train and try out new coping strategies, then it's important that we take the wolf that we are fighting in our dreams serious. If we yeah. would just know it's just in, happening in my mind, I could cuddle with the wolf and, and have no reason to, to fight it. Yeah. Or if, if I know all the other dream characters, uh, they are not real. I, I just imagine then that there's no re uh, like, uh, um, reason for us to, to, to engage with them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, 
there are also other kinds of dreams, uh, like that. They're like uh, dream consciousness differs uh, in in different sleep stages, at least uh, like like somewhat qualitatively. Uh, like uh, during REM sleep, we have these full blown, really hallucinations uh, with a storyline with a lot of action and yes, so on. Yes. Whereas during non REM sleep, we we typically have more of these repetitive, abstract thoughts. And there might indeed be be differences, um, and and this like simulation function of dreaming probably happens more during REM sleep, when mm -hmm. we have like a real mm -hmm. full blown movie that mm -hmm. we are part of, mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, if, if these like more repetitive and almost ruminative thoughts that we sometimes have during non-REM dreams that, that I experience as uh, much more uh, unpleasant than, than a, than a full-blown nightmare, uh, if, if they have a biological function or might be even dysfunctional or so, we, we just don't know. Yeah, so no more research is needed to, to get into Always. that. <laughs> yes, so you have a job yeah. Uh, yeah, to do. Uh, this is a question for um, Anna. Um, the prospect, prospect of awakening, nirvana or enlightenment might be dangerous statements as it states a goal instead of focusing on the premise of mindfulness about being aware of the present. Uh, so isn't there a tension between these two things? Yes, I, I, I wouldn't see awakening as a, as a goal. I, I would see it as a, a consequence of... Um, leading your life in a different way. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you become aware of, of the sort of um, uh, reactive patterns that keep you captivated and are able to, to loosen up from those, those patterns, then um, that is a process of awakening, you could call it. Um, so, so it's more the, the process of, of um, increasing insight and um, increasing freedom from the reactive patterns that, that sort of we have developed in our lives that is um, that I mean by awakening. So it's, it's not a, sometimes a it's seen, of course, by yeah. people as, as, a, as a sort of goal to strive towards and, and that's the eternal uh, sublime, whatever mm -hmm. it is. Mm -hmm. But the, um, the way that... that um, I work with it and that also Stephen Batchelor sort of talks about it is much more working in progress mm -hmm. basically mm -hmm. it's the, it's it's the the way it's the route not the goal not the destiny that's important yeah yeah and it and uh, like uh, more things in life it's it's sort of it goes with ups and downs and sometimes mm -hmm. you have moments that that you feel that that spaciousness and sometimes you realize oh I'm I'm um, uh, I find myself again in the same pitfall as ever and sort of, yeah. 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 Okay. Um, to both, um, a question about lucid dreaming. Is there a relation between lucid dreaming and mindfulness? It, it, uh, it feels that applying mindfulness in its stimulation of threatening situations can be very beneficial. That's an interesting question. There's may, maybe empirically, maybe. I directly start that there, there's actually uh, um, an association. So there are studies showing that uh, mindfulness as assessed by questionnaires, for example, so that the trait of mindfulness um, that is associated with the frequency of, frequency of lucid dreaming. So mm -hmm. people that, that are more mindful, at mm -hmm. least according to questionnaires, um, tend to have more lucid dreams. Um, it is also the case that, that people with many years of mindfulness training um, have more lucid dreams than people without any mindfulness training. Um, somewhat surprisingly, um, if you train like naive people in mindfulness, uh, at least for a couple of weeks, that does not seem to have an effect on lucid dreaming. What frequency. do you mean by naive people? Like, like people who have uh, either never dreamt lucidly before or have never received any mindfulness yeah. training before. Yeah. So, so the, like the, the typical trainings that are also done here. Mm -hmm. um, so it's something uh, for if it you takes time to exactly acquire. If, if you if you if you just like train for even a couple of weeks, that does not appear to directly influence lucid dreaming frequency. Okay. But is it that they they have more lucid dreams, or is it that they might be more aware and and report them more often? That might be the case. Might even be that that people with more lucid dreams tend more to to like uh, like engage in years be, of mindfulness be more interested training. In, yeah. So, so we, we do not know about the causality there. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll come back to you in four years' time with more information on yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, 
Yeah, because this is <laughs> this is part of your your project. Well, dreams actually isn't, but we might we might uh, include it yeah, now. <laughs> it seems seems an interesting <laughs> yeah. uh, interesting question. Yeah, mm. there there, yeah. there is an, in in Buddhist culture that there is even or in certain Buddhist cultures that there is uh, like a tradition of so called dream yoga, which which basically is lucid dreaming. So mm -hmm. that, that like certain um, like Buddhist practitioners like seek to to get into a lucid dream or become aware of the dreaming as a as an environment or state where where they can practice mindfulness even, even to a higher degree or purer form or something like that mm -hmm. here there's a more uh, philosophical question um is relaxation a greater task nowadays than before in other words does a society ask too much from us and therefore is a danger for our need for relaxation that's one for you, I think, uh, Anna. Mm. Well, I don't know whether you've seen the social dilemma. Yeah. The sort of, uh, yeah, so so of, of course with, with all these social media and uh, the information overload that we um, we need to process or, or um, get pushed upon us, that is something that, that actually you need to learn how to deal with if you don't want to sort of <laughs> succumb to it. Yeah. So um, in one way, over over the centuries, people have, of course, have s stressful lives in their own way. Uh, um, so, uh, but in terms of, of information overload, I do think that, that our society might have more information overload than, than uh, previously. And that uh, that, of course, and dangerous uh, relaxation if, if you continuously are are uh, reading emails, looking at uh, uh, Netflix mm -hmm. series, don't have any time to to sort of um, to calm down and to process actually what you have mm -hmm. seen. Um, yes, and and particularly that that quality of of uh, sort of making people addicted to it. So you you need to constantly choose to to yeah to liberate yourself from from this pool mm -hmm. of um, mm -hmm. of these media and that's not easy mm -hmm. so it might be uh, something that we um, need to learn future generations of children to how to do that but 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 couldn't you say that um, um, that people are over awake uh, because mindfulness is about being awake in some in some respects. People are really awake all the time with their, their devices and uh, Netflix, etc. Et that that you could you could also style that as a good thing. So people are people are present and they're very much present in the now. Uh, yes, so but, but their their attention is captivated by things that other people want them to see, and not mm -hmm. uh, by what they want to see themselves. So mm -hmm. you could call it awake. You could call it asleep as well. If you sort of <laughs> mm -hmm. automatically uh, spend hours of your time on your phone, I sometimes sort of are shocked. You, you get that sort of weekly um, report. Yes, and I think, oh well, <laughs> I should. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. Um, it's unawares, isn't it? So, so it's not uh, uh, a conscious choice. It's something that happens. So, I, th I'm, I, I think it's the opposite of awake. Of being really. awake, yeah, the, rather indeed, yeah. indeed, very similar to to like dream experiences, right? That that your attention is externally driven and and forced into certain ways, and that that's one of the like like uh, well classical elements of dream phenomenology that that you. Uh, that you do not like voluntarily and and uh, aware and and consciously choose what to do next, but that, that you are you. really like driven driven yeah. character in in a story without much like deliberate choice, uh, and that is that is indeed very much what of, always have or often happens in in like media uh, consumption and in particular social media consumption that that only afterwards you realize oh I clicked again checking my yeah. whatever feed. Yeah. So, so physiologically, biologically, you could actually see that as, as dreaming rather than being awake, yeah. as I said. Yeah, okay. Um, um, this is a personal question for, for Martin, uh, but maybe some that um, many viewers have. I frequently wake up around 4, 4.30. Which phase would that be and what can I do to stay asleep? 
and sleep deeper of that uh, of that time. So that's a, a yeah. bit of personal advice. Yes. Yeah, so so the, the, so the early morning hours is the, that is more like the depending of course when when you go to sleep. So so they're like. Uh, night owls that that go to sleep exactly at that time, yeah. and for them it would be yeah. uh, like the first phases of sleep, and therefore yeah. deep sleep. But for for most uh, uh, like like gen like ordinary people, ordinary <laughs> chronotypes, um, that is that is the second half, and uh, therefore it is either light sleep or it is REM sleep. Um, however, we we often awake exactly at the transitions between these sleep stages, and and normally go back to sleep quite rapidly. Um, if uh, if one wakes up in the early morning and um, uh, has problems falling asleep again, uh, then the general advice is not trying to force it, but uh, just like wait. And if typically it takes a minute or two or maybe five until you fall asleep again, mm -hmm. if it takes much longer, if it takes 10, 20 minutes, then just get up and do something until you are tired again. Mm -hmm. And uh, as soon as you are tired, then go back to, uh, to bed and then typically it takes a minute or two again or five maximum to, to fall asleep. But do not try to force yourself into sleep since that yeah. will not work. Yeah. And do not click your NOS app and, and yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. follow the That's latest what I news. Do. Yeah. <laughs> and then yeah. <laughs> it is not very effective. No. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Um, we'll come to the um, we've come to the end of um, uh, this um, program. Uh, Martin, Anna, thank you very much for thank your you. lectures and for the uh, very entertaining and interesting conversation. Um, for the viewers at home, um, did you enjoy this program? Did you enjoy um, most of our programs? And do you want to support Radboud Reflex uh, with more than a like or a follow? Uh, you can make a donation for our live stream by going to www.ru.nl uh, RR Donier. Uh, uh, so um, donations are really um, helpful and we would really like to see you to do that. So if you really like this, donate to us. Thank you for watching. Have a nice evening and we hope to see you again live or through a live stream um, uh, with Radboud Reflex. Uh, on behalf of Radboud Reflex and the Donners Institute, have sleep well. Sleep well. <laughs> Thank you very much.